Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And the spiritual person judges all things but he himself is to be judged by no one for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I um, was in a Middle Eastern nation um, about two years ago and I was invited to do quite a fancy schmancy cocktail party and uh, in this cocktail party there were going to be some of the most influential business leaders, business people, uh, people who literally had influence in this particular city that I was at and uh, I was asked to prophesy into that context. Now if you know anything about me, I like atmosphere, I like music playing in the background, I like um, feeling a little bit of God's presence before I just kind of kickstart into the prophetic. And uh, there was no room for this because literally there were guys standing around dressed up in suits, uh, just doing what they normally do at a cocktail party, and then we kind of ding, ding, ding. Uh, Our friend Julian is now going to prophesy. Um, And so it was kind of wild. I was like, Lord Jesus, if you don't show up and show off now, I'm going to be in trouble. And God was so kind and... I got a prophetic word for a Hindu couple who had no church experience whatsoever. They had not put their foot into a church building. So they don't have a context of what we would call charismatic church life. They don't have a concept of even the fact that Jesus is alive and still speaking. Um, And God began to give me a word of knowledge specifically for the... uh, um, the businessman's wife, this particular businessman was responsible for most of the skyscrapers in this particular city I was in. And uh, the Lord began to show me a skyscraper where their house was, this apartment block, this three-level apartment block. And as I saw this, I saw the second level, and I saw a room to the left, and this room was a prayer room. And I saw her sitting in this prayer room praying, and there were numbers of different gods, many different statues, and she was praying, and as she was praying, I heard the things she was praying about. There were uh, four things that God showed me that she'd been praying about, and I saw a picture of Jesus standing on the outside of the room, and he said to me, I want you to tell her that I've heard her prayers, and I am the God who answers, and it was incredible, and uh, in that moment, uh, one of the particular things had to do with healing. She got instantaneously healed. Um, this is at a cocktail party. This is not at, uh, in a church building. Um, and the presence of God just filled the room. And I was very tempted to really go for um, a salvation call at that point. But <laughs> I felt God say to me, I want you to serve these people without any agenda. That the aim of the gospel is not to convince people to become a Christian. The aim of the gospel is to demonstrate the love of God. And it was incredible because the the actual reality is at the end of the evening, uh, someone else got to lead them to Jesus and they're now fully committed members of that particular church. I got to meet them a year later and they were telling me their stories of what God has done for them and in their business. It was very interesting. Part of the word of knowledge that got their attention was the name of their son's very fancy yacht. I love the prophetic. I love moments where God sets us up and we begin to join the dots in what he's doing so that it brings people into an experience with a very kind father. 
And I believe God wants to use all of us in that kind of context because God wants to invade our lives with his thoughts, with his ideas, with his creativity into our world. I, I love it when I hear stories, and I'm hearing stories very often now, of people who, in a moment, as they begin to sense God's presence, because they've begun to develop their spiritual intelligence, as it were, because they've begun to develop their ability to discern what God is doing, they've begun to develop the ability to look for his fingerprints in the moment, outside of just a church building or a worship setting, that God has placed them in significant places of favor. I've got a friend who um, is um, possibly one of the most unqualified people to be working in a business context. But God spoke to him about putting himself in the way of God's favor so that God could get him into places that he could never get himself. And everything in his mind would have said, you should not go there because you're not qualified to go there. But when you're beginning to develop spiritual intelligence, when you're beginning to develop and understanding that God wants to use the ordinary, the everyday, the, the mundane of your life to be appointed to his purpose, in a moment, what would take many years to get you there, God can get you in his favor. And so I want to unpack this idea of spiritual intelligence because the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that we've just read is an invitation to discover the thoughts of God. How many of you know that you can think like God? I mean, that is outrageous. That as you begin to discover how he speaks to you, you begin to develop a language of love that comes from the Father so that you begin to think like him. Moses says it in the Psalms so well, or the psalmist says about Moses so well. He says, Moses, the, the people of Israel knew the acts of God. They could see all the miracles of God. But Moses knew the ways of God. And my aim today is not to give you a skill set that gives you an ability to hear God simply. My aim today is to give you an invitation to an encounter to begin to think like God thinks. To begin to act like God acts. Because the joy of salvation is that you are joined to him. And therefore, you participate and share in his life. I love what the Bible says that Jesus died and was resurrected to life in order that there would be many sons that would come into glory. Now, one of the things that I found, particularly in Western culture, is that conformity governs acceptance. If you conform, you're accepted. And we can often think that that's true of the gospel. That if you conform, if you behave, if you act like a certain person or a certain stereotype, then you're accepted and you're a good Christian. And I fear that we presented Jesus in such a way as to make it, um, to, to make our lives conform to this Middle Eastern man who lived 2,000 years ago in a way that disconnects who we are our personality, our past, our life experience, and in doing so, dial down on who God's created us to be. Notice that Jesus is the only begotten son. I love that. But we are now adopted sons, and God has put a unique personality. God has put a unique set of gifts in you. God has put a unique way of you connecting with him that he wants to develop. And so your past your experiences, your life is not meant to be squashed or erased out of the way. It is meant to be redeemed so that he can use it for his glory. God does not want to squash who you are because it's only in Christ that we fully discover our humanity and it's only in Christ that we fully discover who we are meant to be. God's not called us to conformity. And when you begin to understand that our life in Christ is not one that simply imitates him, but it is one that participates and shares in his life so that we fully become who we are. 
And when we understand that, it's an invitation to begin to search the unsearchable. It's an invitation to begin to search the very depths of God in an incredible way. I um, was asked to pray for a lady who could not fall pregnant. Um, and this is before I met my um, wife, who is a doctor. So I was asked to pray for her, and I felt God show me a doctor's report. And in that context, I could see what was wrong with this lady. And um, I'm obviously not a doctor and don't have any ability to deduce or to make any kind of diagnosis. But I said, I think this is your problem and you should go back to your doctor and tell him this is your problem. And it was incredible because she did go back and that was the problem and she was able to fall pregnant. Here's what I'm wanting to prove by this point. It's that God has a habit of surprising us where we feel least qualified. And as you begin to develop a track record with him, you begin to discover who he is and how he thinks so that the intellectual property of heaven becomes our property too. That's outrageous, right? Like, I, I believe God wants to raise up scientists who understand the mechanism of creation in order to bring about radical healing on the earth. God wants to invite you into an experience of how he created the earth. There might be some year in terms of creativity that God wants to release to come up with not just another nice thing, but something that begins to reshape culture in creativity. And he wants to do that primarily through you developing an internal reality that is awakened to him and a spiritual intelligence that begins to be developed and shaped. And so I want to encourage you, God's inviting you to search out the unsearchable, to search out that which is hidden in him. And, and just before, some people might want to accuse me of being Gnostic. Gnosticism is the desire to look for something beyond Jesus, as if there's more than Jesus. The reality is that Jesus is everything that we need. But in him is mystery that's still to be unfolded and discovered. And you and I get the privilege of discovering that. And so I want to encourage you, God wants to unlock spiritual intelligence. I love Jesus. Um, Jesus has this ability to be in any context, in any crowd, and figure out really what's happening. In one context, he heals a man with a withered hand, and um, the reality is, in that moment, Pharisees are wanting to trap Jesus and they're wanting to literally um, arrest him in that moment. But Jesus, perceiving what's in their heart, simply brings a clear answer and heals the person on the Sabbath and gives an incredible answer to, as a rebuttal to their accusations. Another time he's walking, Jesus the carpenter, He's walking past some fishermen and says, throw your net on the other side. Um, I, I don't know how many of you would like to take an advice in your particular profession from someone who has no clue about that profession. Yet the economic result for those families meant that they had to call some other boats to come and help gather the fish. Imagine what it was like at the market that day when they sold all of that. You see, we so often disqualify ourselves because we view ourselves through the lens of our natural ability. And we often place our intelligence quota above the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit to release spiritual intelligence, answers, ideas, thoughts that can bring incredible breakthroughs to people. I've got friends who literally... God will speak to them in dreams. And those dreams will be so significant that particular governments and heads of state will phone them up before they make a decision to ask them to dream or to hear from God. The, this stuff is not just, as someone once said, pie in the sky for the day that we die. It's steak on the plate while we wait. This is a reality that we get to enter into right now. 
I, I get the privilege of sitting with a number of business people, helping shape the culture of their companies, helping bring prophetic words of destiny into their lives. And all I'm, excuse me, all I'm doing is learning how to use my spiritual intelligence, repackage it in a language that makes it accessible. I'm not dialing down on who Jesus is. I'm not dialing down on those things. All I'm simply doing is creating an atmosphere where it's easy to find Jesus. God wants to invite you to use spiritual intelligence more often. The problem is the West, the Western construct, our Western society is far too busy. And we have to become a people who learn to listen a bit more. We have to become a people who learn how to engage in the presence of God and with God when it's inconvenient. And I've begun to discover that friendship with God is one of the most inconvenient things ever. Because he loves interrupting my normal day. And if I can learn how to recognize when he interrupts, if I can learn how to recognize the moment of favor, if I can learn how to recognize his fingerprints upon a particular deal, upon a particular conversation, upon a particular relationship, that when he interrupts me and I lean into him, those moments can become moments of destiny. Not just for me, but those people I'm serving. And we have to learn how to tune in to God. One of the greatest revelations for me around learning to listen is not in my ability to hear, but in my enjoyment of sonship. I spoke briefly in an earlier session that when the Bible talks in Hebrews chapter 1 that God now speaks to us through Jesus, his son, the, the, the translation there carries the sense of God's language to us is sonship. And one of the things that we have to learn how to do is how to be a good son. How to be good sons and daughters who enjoy his presence, who enjoy who he is, who enjoy the flow of his grace in our life. Because when we do that, we get to access all that heaven has for us. Here's the incredible thing. As a son, I fully reflect the Father. One of the reasons why Jesus was crucified, was because he said, I am the Son of God. And in Jewish Hebrew culture, when you say that, what that literally means is that you are equating yourself to God himself. Because the Son fully represents the Father in every way. The Son is fully authorized to do business on behalf of the Father in every way, as if the Father is there. And here's the beauty, theologian J.I. Packer says this, that the incredible truth of our adoption means that as Jesus Christ has been exalted to the highest place, we now, not based on our effort or our merit, have in Christ been exalted to the same place. We have been elevated. The only difference between Jesus and us if he is begotten of the Father, unique in every way, we are adopted into that reality. Brothers and sisters, our yearning from God is very simply based on enjoying our sonship. I um, have a 20-month-old son, and I'm thoroughly enjoying how he's learning how to speak at the moment. Um, and the reality is his speech for good or for bad, is a reflection of what I'm saying. Everything he does in these moments as he learns to hear my voice is reflected in what he says. When you get to understand that the posture of hearing God's voice is not in an intellectual ascent, but it is in childlike wonder, you get to enjoy the process a whole lot more. Yet Jesus 
makes this incredible statement in the gospel. She says, in order to enter the kingdom, you've got to become like a child. Childlikeness is the entrance point for kingdom activity. And I fear that the early church, which had a very simple gospel, God is good, Father's good, I'm saved, my sins have been forgiven, God is not holding his sin against me, Jesus is the Son of God, produced a community that transformed and radically changed the whole of the Middle East. But we've got an intellectual gospel that's not producing much. The simplicity of hearing God's voice, the simplicity of developing your spiritual intelligence does not begin in your ability to gather information. It begins in your enjoyment of sonship. I, I, for me, that just takes all the pressure off. It's so good. I don't have to work hard at being a son. In fact, it's no effort on my part. I'm a son because I'm a son because I'm a son. And the fundamental aim of salvation is not your justification to say that your sins are forgiven. The fundamental aim of salvation is your adoption as sons and daughters. It's why it's so important that we understand that it's not just about God being a father, but it is about what kind of father God is. He is supremely good. He is very kind. How many of you know that you are unpunishable? All of the punishment that was needed to cover your sin, Jesus received on the cross. All of the consequence that was needed for sin's gross impact on society, past present and future, was settled at the cross. God is not into punishment. God doesn't want to punish you. He's not wanting to punish the world. He's not going to smite Las Vegas <laughs> with an earthquake because there is no punishment left in the Father because sin has been dealt with. Not that there ever was punishment in God's heart anyway. You're unpunishable. It means that you cannot fail. It means that when you step out and do something for him, even if it flops according to worldly standards, you still have not failed. I, for me, that's the most liberating truth. It frees me up to be who I know I want to be. And you see, one of the things that we do is we quote an Old Testament understanding when we talk about John the Baptist saying, I must decrease that he might increase. When you understand that in context, John is saying that all of the law and the prophets that have been prophesying up until now, their voices are becoming silent and must decrease so that the voice of sonship in Jesus can increase. God does not want to diminish who you are. He wants to release who you fully are because this is the beauty of the incarnation. God the Father clothes himself in flesh as a man in order to teach us what it means to be fully human. He's not wanting to cook it, cut you. He's not wanting to cause you to deny yourself in a way that's contrary to scripture, he's wanting to unlock. But, you know, people often quote that scripture to me. Whoever wants to follow Jesus must pick up his cross and deny himself. I, I don't know if you've ever understood that, but the reality is my old nature, my old self, died on the cross with Jesus. All the stuff that meant I was blocked off from enjoying radical relationship with God has died in Christ, the Bible says. I now live in the reality of sonship. So when Jesus says to pick up my cross, the cross for the Christian is not a place of despair. It's not a place of pain anymore. The cross for the Christian 
is the place of promise of resurrection life. When Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's not saying, become a worm in the sand. He's not saying, you're worth nothing. He's saying, all of the promise that is embodied in the cross and resurrection is yours now to carry. Man, that's exciting. In Romans chapter 12, where it says, in view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice to God. God's not asking you to get on an altar to die. When you understand the whole book of Romans, Paul is contrasting death and life, death and life, death and life. And he's saying you are now dead to your old self. And he's saying that dead body, much like the body of Jesus that was dead, is to be offered to Jesus because his resurrection life now wants to flow through you. Being a living sacrifice is not some painful self-denial. Being a living sacrifice is an invitation into the resurrection life of Jesus. Friends, I want to encourage you, your sonship does not mean to be less than who you are. It means to be fully who God created you to be. It means the creative gifts, the anointing, the callings, the graces that he's put in you is the very thing he now wants to unlock in you. And for most of us, we're so afraid of walking into pride, we're so afraid of walking into disobedience that sometimes we tend to have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive us than we do in God's ability and spirit to lead us. You're a new creation. You are predisposed to the goodness of God. He wants to lead you. And we so often double question every single motive that we miss moments of favor we miss moments of impact because we are so consumed by trying to deny ourselves rather than being fully who God's created us to be. Spiritual intelligence is about hearing God's voice in the way that he's created you in order to have impact. The way I hear from God is not going to be the way you're going to hear from God. The way I connect with God is not going to be the way you're going to connect with God. And I just want to give you permission today to be you. <coughs> and to connect with God. In a little bit, uh, in, in one of the next sessions, I'm going to talk about how you get to connect with God like that. God wants to release many sons, individual sons, who have a voice because your story is important. Your story is important to him. How do I begin to develop some of the spiritual intelligence? Well, the first thing I want to say, your whole life, from the day that you were born to now, is God preparing you to walk in a life of hearing his voice? That the things you studied, the experiences you've had, some of them which have not been God-ordained, God can use to set you up for success. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? You know, God, sometimes we, we think that God ordains evil things or bad things to happen to us, because very often God shows up in the mess and turns it into something good that we could think maybe that was God's will. That is a misrepresentation of his goodness. God is always good. He's not going to send anything bad to you. I'm going to say amen to that point myself because I think that was good. His sovereignty does not mean that he's going to get you ready for failure and difficulty and suffering just to teach you a lesson. But he sure is good at showing up in the midst of difficulties and taking what looks like absolute disaster and turning it around for your good. He really is. He really, really is. I can tell you story after story about that. And he wants to use everything in your life as an opportunity to hear his voice, to see his voice, and to engage with his voice. You study what you study because God wants to use what you study. God wants to use your experience in life. God wants to use my experience of growing up in apartheid South Africa for the first 12 years of my life as a sign and a wonder to many people. Do you know, I'll never forget as a 22-year-old young pastor, I was called out into the northern suburbs of Cape Town to go and pray for a military man who was one of the key people that the government used, the party government used, to assassinate any of the struggle um, 
and, and freedom fighters. And I love that God was using a person of color to bring freedom to an ex-racist. Well, he wasn't ex-racist afterwards. Um, <laughs> because of the torment that he was feeling because of the numbers of people that he killed. It's the beauty of the gospel. I, I was born for this. You were born in the body, the skin color, the family, the dynamic, and God wants to use that. Don't deny it. He wants to use that. When you recognize that your whole life is a setup for God's favor, even the bad stuff becomes an opportunity to redeem. Secondly, developing spiritual intelligence begins with understanding that very often the natural is an opportunity to lean into the supernatural. You see, most Christians, when it comes to hearing God's voice, think that they're going to get a sound that's going to come from heaven that will sound a bit like Sean Connery with a bit of a Scottish accent and speaking the King James Version, thus saith the Lord. That, that's not how God speaks. God wants to use your natural and make it supernatural. Remember Moses. He is walking in desert. I've been in a desert in the Middle East. It is hot stuff. <laughs> and there's a burning bush. I, I don't think a burning bush is that un uncommon. But something happens when he walks past something that is not uncommon, something that could be deemed fairly natural in a desert. And he stops, and the Bible says he looks again. And in that moment, he realizes that the bush is not being consumed. You see, many of us don't stop to look again in our natural context. And we miss the moment that God's speaking. And when you learn to look again, when you learn to lean into the, into the purposes of God, the natural then becomes supernatural. In John chapter 12, there's a voice that comes from heaven, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, saying, this is my son, hear him. And there are three responses that happen in that moment. Some people say, oh, it just thundered. <laughs> and they take what is supernatural and reduce it to something that's just very common. I, I want to encourage you. Sometimes God wants to speak to us, and because we don't have the right filter, we don't recognize him. Others in that context say, no, 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 no it's an angel that's speaking from heaven. And they ass assign the wrong supernatural activity in that moment to that event. And then Jesus says, no, this is my Father in heaven and brings clarity around that. But here's my point. When you begin to lean into God, there are moments where God will speak. There are moments where God's going to do some stuff. There are moments where his fingerprints are going to be on a deal, on a relationship, in a particular context, where suddenly something's going to begin to happen that didn't happen before, and you have an opportunity to ignore that or to engage with that. You know, one of the things that I'm learning to do is I'm learning to train my senses. You've got a physical body that God wants to use to speak through. And now for some of you who may be more intellectually driven, this might frustrate you for a moment, but I promise you God can speak to you anyway. There are moments when I'll be talking to someone and suddenly my right or my left hand will start getting very warm. And I'm like, what is going on? And most often in that moment, it's an opportunity that I've begun to recognize this is my love language with God. Because I then ask him, God, what's going on? This, it was, it's very hot suddenly. What's going on? It's not a hot day. I'm in an air-conditioned room. Why are my hands suddenly burning? It's in those moments that I have an opportunity. Because what seems natural become supernatural in that moment. And most often in that moment, I get to pray for the sick and people get healed instantly. It, it's so simple. When you live a life aware of his world, then you begin to recognize him breaking into our world. And that right there is called spiritual intelligence. Recognizing when he breaks into our world. So cultivating and training your senses. The other, the third area in terms of recognizing spiritual intelligence and being able to uh, connect with what God is doing around you 
is by cultivating a soft heart. You know, the Bible talks about this in Luke chapter 8, that there are different um, kinds of grounds. And the Bible says that the word of the kingdom is like a seed that goes into the ground. And you'll see different kinds. You see a hard ground. You see a ground that is over, uh, overrun with thorns. And one of the things that I've discovered is that if I don't cultivate the garden within my heart, it makes it hard for me to recognize the moments that God drops a word into my life. And so I live a life free of offense. I, I'm unoffendable. You cannot offend me. Because as my friend Jared Hine once said, offense, uh, offense is never given, it's always taken. I live an unoffendable life. I live a life that filters what's coming into my heart, into my thought life. Because I refuse to allow the world around me to dominate my thought life. You know, I'm not talking about being super religious and, you know, not watching TV or... I'm just simply saying what you allow in, unfiltered, will dominate your ability to recognize when God's breaking in and it will stunt your spiritual intelligence. It's interesting, we, we're having this incredible time with um, our little boy trying to teach him stuff. And the impact of TV, iPad, media upon the brain development of a child is quite destructive at a certain age. And I'm learning to go, do you know what? I wonder if that's true of adults too. Because we so often allow stuff in, unfiltered, unchecked, that when God breaks in, we haven't got a grid to recognize him. We've got to learn to silence the world around us. Not only that, I, I began to understand something about my heart I needs to continually be pliable. And that requires, that pliability comes out of the place of worship. And I'm not talking about just having a quiet time. I'm talking about enjoying God because he wants us to be enjoyed. Once, once, he wants to be enjoyed by us. What's your heart like? Because your heart is going to determine your ability to walk in spiritual intelligence. The other aspect is learning to study and meditate upon biblical encounters. Listen, there, there are some people who are running after all sorts of fancy-filled extra-biblical encounters. I just want to get the biblical encounters right first. <laughs> if we can get that right and enjoy that, then we can talk about traveling to different planets and all sorts of other weird stuff that some people are talking about right now. Can I encourage you? The Bible is full of incredible encounters. Won't you study it? Won't you ask God, if you did it for Ezekiel, that he could see wheels within wheels? If an angel appeared for Moses, won't you do this for me too? Won't you open this for me too? And then lastly, we have to learn how to develop a, what's the word I'm looking for? A diary of God encounters with him. Memorialize the moments when God has spoken to you. Memorialize the moments when God joined the dots for you because very often those memorials point the way to which he'll speak to you again. And when you develop that kind of secret place of celebrating what God is doing, not what he's not doing, it makes it easier for you to be able to recognize moments and engage your spiritual senses so that God can break out in his kingdom. Friends, you need to develop memorials of God's goodness because when the going gets tough, it's those memorials that keep us standing because if he could do it then, Surely he'll do it now. When you close your eyes, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your goodness. I pray that we will learn how to walk in spiritual intelligence. And as I unpack this over the next session to God, I pray that you would help us find our space. God, we want to repent 
for denying who you've created us to be. And we want to embrace everything that you've put in us and created us to be fully, wholeheartedly, so that we can enjoy our sonship in you. In Jesus' name, amen.